Good evening, everyone. As you join us here for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's monthly event, our webinar this evening, Turn On Your Red Light, we'll get started in just a few moments. We're going to allow everybody to come into our Zoom webinar right now. We are also being joined by participants on Facebook Live. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will be starting just shortly. And at this time, I see that a few participants have joined us here on Zoom, and we will be getting going. As more start, as more come in, we will certainly welcome them as well. So thank you again for joining us at tonight's presentation of Turn On Your Red Light, a scandalous webinar being brought to you by the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. We are presenting this webinar free on Facebook Live and here on Zoom. Although we do have memberships available for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa and contributions are welcome. So be sure to go to historicalsocietysantarosa.com to make your contribution. I wanna point out to those of you that are joining us on Facebook Live that we will entertain your questions that you key into the comments. All questions, will be facilitated after the presentation tonight at about the last 30 minutes. Our presentation will be about an hour long. So those that are on Zoom this evening, you will be keying your questions into the chat bar and those questions will be held until after the presentation and I will be facilitating those questions with our presenter this evening. Let me introduce myself. My name is Leslie Graves and I am your Zoom host and your MC. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter. Jeff Elliott is a veteran journalist who has written nationally for magazines and newspapers. He turned full-time to historical research after retiring and now authors the SantaRosaHistory.com website, which if you haven't been there, please bookmark it. You need to go. This is where you can find over 800 articles on local history. Join me now in welcoming our presenter of Turn On Your Red Light, Mr. Jeff Elliott. Thank you, Leslie. In a moment, we're going to jump in our Wayback Machine and return to 1905 Santa Rosa. That was the year before the Great Earthquake. But first, let's get our bearings. 1905 Santa Rosa is a small town. It's about exactly the same size as Sebastopol is today, 2022. So when I talk about how close together places were in Santa Rosa back then. I'd like you to think about Sebastopol today. It also had about the same number of people. A little over 7,200 people were living in Santa Rosa then and about the same number in Sebastopol now. And many of the things we're going to discuss in the next hour are shocking, not just because they happened here in Santa Rosa, but that they could happen in any town such a small size. So let's step out of our time machine. It's a Saturday night in August. We're downtown on a very crowded 4th Street. On that balcony of our fine courthouse, there's a brass band. They're playing popular tunes of the day. Children play and dance on the courthouse lawn. Stores are open until after midnight because this is generally shopping day. And all those people that are filled 4th Street are shopping. So here's a map looking north. As you can see on, on the left, much, you can still, much of it is still recognizable. The courthouse is there, square is still there on the left. And the library is over there on the right. That's 4th Street there at the top, of course. A few streets have changed their names over the years, and banks have gener generally replaced the big hotels. But there's one big difference. 
This was our red light district. Santa Rosa had 11 brothels centered around 1st and D streets. And many of those were large buildings and some had two stories. Now the same week that the PD described that little picture, perfect view of turn of century America, where we're all frolicking on the lawns, the Santa Rosa Republican printed a shocking expose that compared the scene in downtown Santa Rosa to a frontier mining camp. There were hundreds of out of town men who came here not to celebrate small town life, but to break the law with gambling and prostitution. So there's quite two quite different Santa Rosas. One's the city of roses, and the other is sort of the sin city of the North Bay. Now, if you read history enough, you know that history usually ends up being more complicated and messy than you'd expect. And we're about ready to wade in deep into some serious historical muck. Remember that I told you not to wear your good shoes. Until the 1905 newspaper expose, the powers that be pretty much ignored that there was any sort of community problem here, much less any ongoing and blatant criminal activity. That includes Santa Rosa's government, the business and financialist interests in town, and both the Press Democrat and the Republican papers. When the PD finally conceded there were some serious problems, the editor waved it off, suggesting the Santa Rosa Tenderloin, it had emerged on its own about a decade after the Civil War. Well, I call bull on that claim. It's most likely that the criming started in the late 1880s and was nurtured by the town's leadership. Believe the story actually began when Cronkies Park opened in 1886. Now this was a privately owned amusement park. It's where 4th Street meets McDonald and College Avenue. Today it's an apartment complex. For 25 cents admission, the attractions included races and weekly special events such as the sword contest, where you could watch a couple of guys whack at each other in a medieval sort of way. They also had an, an enclosed bowling alley and there was a little swimming pool in the back towards the, where the creek was. And it was generally lots of fun. But notice here in this ad, here at the bottom it says, Grand Excursion from San Francisco. From Cronkey's agent in the city, anyone could buy a round trip train ticket to Santa Rosa at the subsidized price of $1. And up to 1,500 San Franciscans came up to Santa Rosa each Sunday. These special trains continued throughout the rest of 1886 and the next three years that followed. But problems mounted because these trips were attracting more and more troublemakers. There were free-for-all fights at the park, all-night drunken carousing and people being assaulted on the sidewalks. There's quite a contrast. A newspaper article noted that the excursions to this city and Cronkies Park Sunday was made up chiefly of hoodlums. But it, another item from those years said brightly, we have begun to look upon Cronkies Park as a necessity. In fact, it would be difficult to tell what we would do without it. Quite a conflict. But there's, there's really two important things that are happening in those years. San Franciscans learned that Santa Rosa really wasn't so far away and it was easy to reach by train. And Santa Rosa learned that those day tripping tourists brought in money, enough money that it was worthwhile to tolerate rowdiness and even some crime. Well, the park closed in 1890 and I've written the past that there have been hints that the following years that Santa Rosa was essentially developing 
an underground economy that was based on saloon gambling and maybe, maybe prostitution. There was a very popular minister at the Presbyterian Church here, and he was fired. The reason given was that he had greatly displeased some of the wealthiest members of the congregation. According to that same article in a San Francisco paper, it was because he was railing against dancing, card playing, and other matters. Well, from the context, it's clear that the preacher's objection to dancing wasn't against the social dance parties that were regularly held by churches here around town. We're going to skip a bit ahead to 1904. 1904 is when Alan Lemon, the editor and publisher of the Santa Rosa Republican, decide he decides he needs to cut back a little on his workload. He was also the town's postmaster, and he was really more of a printer than a journalist anyway. So he leased the newspaper to a couple hotshot newsmen from Oakland. Now, again, 1904, this is the golden age of muckraking journalism. And these two men transformed our sleepy little farmer's journal into the county's must-read newspaper. They revealed that the Santa Rosa schools were in such terrible shape, and they were so overcrowded that some students were being taught in outbuildings that weren't even attended for human occupancy, essentially feed sheds. They wrote that a no-good son of a prominent family had been arrested 23 times in Santa Rosa and charged with felonies, but he had never gone to jail. But it was this headline that really shook things up. There's no question that here, in 1905, that Santa Rosa had become a deeply corrupt place. The article that in this issue showed that local police had been turned into something like casino floor managers, watching only for cheats. The Republican paper reported that two deputies were spotted gambling, and an unnamed prominent city official was also among those betting and inviting his friends to come on up. The chief of police passed the buck to the sheriff, saying these are state laws that are being broken. The police chief also said that the city council had told him only to prevent crooked games. He said, I'm powerless to do anything if the council won't back me up. So apart from the PR slogan that would be coined in about 40 years later, Santa Rosa wasn't, yes, the city designed for a living. In 1905, it was the city designed for vice. The Republican paper had revealed Santa Rosa's biggest dirty little secret. The town had thrown out a welcome mat for big spending gamblers by not enforcing state and local laws. You only have to look at that size of our red light district to see the scope of the problem. Now, Leslie's probably getting floated, a flood of questions like, well, was it really that bad? And you know, how do we know exactly how, how, how many buildings there were? Well, that's easy to prove because this, we've been looking at the Sanborn fire insurance maps. These show every building within city limits, including outhouses, and indicate how the buildings were being used. A bordello was considered a business, and in Sanborn shorthand, it was indicated as female boarding house, or an abbreviation. This is what you're looking at right here, is a close-up of the intersection of First and D Streets. Those Sanborn maps can be trusted because insurance policies and core decisions depended completely upon their accuracy. Look at the map again. Make no mistake, this is a big district. The only other place in the North Bay where there are more brothels was Vallejo. And that was not only a much larger town, but it had all the sailors that were stationed at the Mare Island Navy base. 
Most towns had none. Petaluma, for example, which was about at the time was about two-thirds the size of Santa Rosa, had two cottages down by the river. Well, all those brothels meant lots of prostitutes as well, and they in turn need lots of customers. So who were the Johns? Santa Rosa had about 2,500 adult men at the time, and some of us are probably now reaching for the family album, wondering if it's time to reevaluate great grandpa. Well, the probably the certainly we know that there certainly was some local trade, but almost all of the customers came up from San Francisco on the train, and they came by the hundreds, just as they had done in the late 1880s. Well, what drew them here wasn't just the appeal of our sex workers in the Tenderloin District. The Red Light District was really more of a sideshow to the main attraction of gambling. The top money draw here was horse racing. Sonoma County's reputation for breeding championship horses dates to before the Civil War. This is Lou Dillon, who broke a world record and was bred, raised, and trained here at the Santa Rosa Stock Farm, which is now the, the county fairgrounds. This, this horse was raced nationally for years and even was went sent to Europe for a tour. The number of visitors who came here to bet on races and the amount of money they gambled could be substantial. Even an off-season race could draw 500 men from San Francisco and side bets on the racetrack were mentioned that paid twice what an average American worker made in an entire year. But Santa Rosa was a gambler's mecca, even when the ponies weren't running. The saloons and hotels along 4th Street and Main Street were openly running illegal games, including roulette, craps, faro, and Klondike. And the Republican papal paper revealed that boys were welcome to bet in the, these back rooms alongside professional gamblers. And there were a lot of those back rooms. So if your luck was bad at one place, you were never more than a few doors away from another, particularly if you're just staggering down 4th Street. Now, I don't know exactly how many places there were to drink and gamble in 1905. But after the great 1906 earthquake, every bar owner had to reapply for a liquor license. And the newspapers printed that list. There were more than three dozen applications. Given that many buildings still had not been rebuilt, it's, just, it's pretty safe to say there were even more than that in 1905. And here's a map of where the 1906 saloons were were projected on a map of modern Santa Rosa. You'll see that bulk of them are between Railroad Square and Courthouse Square. Quite a number. And I come back to how this town can be compared to modern day Sebastopol. Imagine Sebastopol with shoulder to shoulder bars like this. And keep in mind too, that women were not allowed in any of these places. Downtown Santa Rosa was in large part a man's domain, and a domain of out-of-town men at that. Just as Santa Rosa had its long-standing policy of betting illegal gambling in the saloons, it unofficially sanctioned prostitution. But in this case, police were the enforcers of a monthly government shakedown. Once a month, an officer would stop by and cite the madam, who was running the brothel, for serving liquor without a license. The fine was $10, and the woman had to put up a $30 bail. But wouldn't you know it? For some woman, reason, the woman rarely appeared in court, so the bail was forfeit. Thus, the city raked in three times the amount of money they would have gotten just if she had paid the fine. Well, who was profiting from this trade other than the city? The owners of these buildings were not absentee slumlords or 
pimps running a prostitution racket. They were just local investors whose portfolio included brothels. Some of the lead some of the leading citizens profited from the trade directly. Khan Shay owned much of the prime real estate downtown, and he owned at least three of these buildings. He was also the vice president and director of the Savings Bank of Santa Rosa. Another landlord was Doc Summerfield, the town veterinarian. So there's an interesting story about the good doctor that suggests he had a little side business going. One evening, he had an upset stomach and reached into his medicine cabinet for a jar. Well, to his horror, he realized he'd picked the wrong container and he had swallowed the pill of mercury bichloride, enough to kill several people. He rushed to the pharmacy and he was given, given an emetic and an antidote. The next day he was fine. But why did he keep such a deadly poison on close on hand? Well, at the time, mercury, mercury bichloride was mainly used in tiny doses to treat syphilis. And conveniently, Doc Summerfield's home and office was at the corner of First and Main, just a few doors down from the Tenderloin district. Well, it was probably complaints about venereal disease. That was why Santa Rosa took up a brave and reckless step in 1907. The town legalized and licensed something very much like modern day Nevada style prostitution. This announcement hit the papers exactly on the one year anniversary of the earthquake. But the decision by the city council had been made a week earlier in a secret session. Now proprietors of the boarding houses would have to pay $45 per quarter. The guests who lived there would have to be examined by a medical doctor every two weeks and forced to leave if they were found to have any contagious or dangerous disease. Well, as you might expect, the respectable citizens of Santa Rosa erupted in outrage. Religious leaders and outraged public figures queued up to denounce the decision at a standing room only meeting. And well, sorry, nothing could be done. The council had the power to do this under the new city charter. You wonder if some of them were thinking back to that expose story two years earlier in the Republican, where the reporters wrote that there was a scheming coterie of gentlemen who managed to protect their private interests by the conduct of the city government. And that's how matters stood for five months. Then a woman who lived nearby filed a lawsuit, but she didn't file, she didn't sue the city or the city council. She sued the landlord of a brothel at 721st Street. Miss Nancy Lou Farmer claimed her property values had dropped and the, the home comforts of the family have been destroyed because the plaintiffs have compelled her to listen to the vile, obscene, and profane language of the inhabitants. It was further alleged that the person there had been seen in immodest dress and even in the nude. Miss Farmer was uh, a sixth, fifth and sixth grade teacher at the Fremont School, and here she is with her class in, I believe, 1908. This is unfortunately the only picture I've ever been able to find of her. The man she sued was Dan Beamer, who owned the sporting goods store downtown. Beamer had the building custom built to be a bordello in the style of a crib. That meant there were many small rooms only big enough for a bed, a uh, table with a washstand and a chair. Each room had its own outside door. Now, the powers that be could make the case that, look, Bamer was just no different from any commercial real estate developer. I mean, he was just building to suit something that would meet, you know, 
the client's unique needs. Well, all right. But it came to court, and Lou's test, Lou Farmer's testimony was great fun. Loud cussing apparently wasn't the worst of it. Miss Farmer saw women were walking along the street and on the porch in front of the house, clad very scantily. Once a woman, minus stockings and shoes, blasted a poor delivery man with water from a garden hose. Fortunately, the man got away. One night, Miss Farmer estimated there were 50 men lined up in the street waiting for admission, and she saw 25 go in and out in an hour. She said she recognized a number of the men and was willing to announce in court, in open meeting, who they were if it was desired. Some of them, she said, were prominent, too. The judge said it was not necessary, naming the names really wasn't necessary. Most of the defense testimony came from Miss Sa Mrs. Sadie McLean, who rented the Beamer house. Now, this photo is not Sadie McLean, but whenever I think about Sadie, I think of this picture. This is the mugshot of a madam who is about the same age as her, who was locked up in San Quentin at about the same time. I particularly like that they allowed her to wear her hat to prison. Sadie told the court that she rented the place from Beamer for 25 a month and charged the women who were boarding there $5 a week. There are other witnesses, including Bertie Hibbard and Opal Browning, who admitted in court that they were living at the boarding house and plying their vacation applying their, their vocations as sporting girls. Well, the judge ordered the names of the other women who were listed in the physician's certificate book to be read in court. Now, the names list of names was like a dainty list of flower, flower titles. There were violets, daisies, lilies, rosies, pansies, flossies, and one Gladys and one Bernice. To all these, the notation from the doctor was they were found to be okay. Called back to the stand, Miss Farmer continued. She and her aged mother were continued witnesses to the disgusting scenes that were enacted at the McLean house. The nearness to her property had ruined the enjoyment of her home, and the injunction suit was her only relief. Otherwise, she'd have to change residence. And here's the believe it or not twist to the story. Miss Lou and Mrs. Sadie were not actually neighbors. The farmer house was on the next block, two lots east of the boarding house. And beside the spacious backyard behind their home, the farmers had a fence on First Street the only way Miss Farmer could have witnessed the disgusting scenes was by peeping over a backyard fence and sideways at a sharp angle. Alas, Miss Farmer was apparently not asked to explain exactly how craning her neck over a fence to get an eyeful of the doings two doors down on the next block had ruined the enjoyment of her home. But the court finding was for Miss Lou Farmer. It seemed that the city ordinance had not explicitly authorized the occupation of prostitution. Well, the Blue Nose faction in Santa Rosa claimed this was a, a mandate to shut down the entire red light district. And at the end of 1907, the district attorney said he would be personally taking charge of the prosecution of anyone leasing or renting property for immoral purposes. No, didn't happen. The next insurance map shows only two of the 11 bordellos had closed, and Beamer's place remained a crib house. Police resumed busting Badams for liquor violations, including Kitty Gallagher and the dramatically named May Tempest. Following the city's elections in 1908, 
the city council repealed the, the prostitution ordinance as its first act of business. They vowed they would close the red light district. But the clique that ran the town really wanted to keep the red light district around at all costs. And they floated several ideas. The craziest one was to create a special tenderloin district on West 6th Street, perhaps something like New Orleans Storyville. Well, the plan to dump the prostitutes on the Italian neighborhood showed there was no plan whatsoever and no city leadership. It was one thing to posture and make fine speeches about cleaning up the town, but not so easy in practice. All this time, an appeal on the farmer decision was working its way through the courts. Finally, in April 1909, the state Supreme Court upheld the decision. A property owner may not injure his neighbor by permitting the premises to be used for prostitution. In 90 days, the red light district would be no more. Long story short, Santa Rosa's tenderloin is finally coming to an end and closing only because the court had ruled that brothel property owners, the rich and respectable men, could be, pro could be prosecuted. Now, they weren't ready to give up quite that easily. And several of the landowners, particularly Con Shea, came up with the noticed that in the original decision that it said that the, the, the property couldn't be leased for prosecution for prostitution. Aha, loophole, they apparently thought. So they had the madams sign rent to buy contracts so that the, uh, it, would, it would appear that the, the madams, if they owned the property, it might, be, it might be perfectly illegal. Well, the DA had other opinions of that and went to court. There was a long trial and the jury was out for six hours, came back with a hung jury. There was never an attempt to bring it back, so the idea was dropped. The local prohibition newsletter, however, mentioned that some of the former red denizens of the suppressed district had taken up their abode in other places in Santa Rosa. It's likely that there was a Santa Rosa blue book sold under the counter at saloons and cigar shops. These had advertised where to find the women. These tiny booklets were small enough to fit, to discreetly tuck in, into a vest pocket and were commonly found in big and small cities of that era. But even if the ban was t loosely enforced, it closed the chapter on 20 years of history of Santa Rosa's downtown tenderloin. But however, it was getting ready to fade away anyway. And what killed it wasn't a court decision or moralistic crackdown. It was the automobile. Also in 1909, the roadhouse scene began to explode on the outskirts of town and along the whole stretch of the Sonoma Valley Road. This is a roadhouse outside of the town of Sonoma, but there are many others that were called the One Mile House, the Two Mile House, and so on. Santa Rosa complained that the town was being constrained because there's so many roadhouses on every street, on, on every road leading in and out of town. Roadhouses were always had a reputation for skirting the law, which was part of their rough appeal. But never before had the Santa Rosa newspapers mentioned there were in problems with prostitution in rural areas. Soon that was going to change, such as when a large brothel outside of Sebastopol was raided and closed. Now, this isn't the time and place to dive into Roadhouse history, but I'll say only that prostitution in the greater Santa Rosa area probably increased. Since out-of-towners arriving by car didn't have cars, since out-of-towners arriving by train didn't have cars, however, well, how did they get to the Roadhouses? Well, that's easy. Because starting in late 1910, a new Santa Rosa taxi cab company was popping up every single month. 
And about the same time, the booming playland along the Russian River was getting underway. The railway coming up the coast from San Francisco finally connected with a little train that rattled along the river. And every year, there were new places opening along the river, making a nearly continuous party scene. Well, in our five-year journey from 1905 to 1910, what actually changed? Not much, really. Great crowds of men came up here for the races, except now the bending of the track near downtown was on, on autos and not horses. There were just as many saloons, but in 1910, at least, they finally passed an ordinance to keep the children out of, out of the, the saloons. The prostitutes and madams of Santa Rosa's red light district were still around, just considerably more discreet in their trade. In the 1910 census, Sadie McLean was no longer at Bamer's crib. She had moved a couple of doors down to an even larger house. In the census, she listed her employer as living on her own income. Several other women that we know were madams were at the same addresses they'd always been at. But now they were just supposedly running a rooming house. The curious thing, some only claimed to have one tenant, and some claimed to be making a living as the landlady while having no tenants at all. Leslie? Yeah, if you web such a nice story out of this. It's just intriguing to learn about Miss Farmer and her propensity to look over that fence and find out what her neighbors are doing behind the house, right? It's a it's a it's a joy to listen to you. Thank you so much for sharing sharing that story and this history of Santa Rosa. Those brief 20 years really packed in a lot of what ended up kind of forming our our city here. Thank you, Leslie. Now for those of you, what's that? Thank you, Leslie. Oh, yeah. Now, for those of you that are listening in, you are more than welcome to ask questions by keying them into our chat bar. Um, if you are here and joining us on Zoom, if you're joining us this evening on Facebook, you can key in your questions or comments into the comment section. And we do have an administrator standing by who will then take those questions and share them here on Zoom in the chat so that I can facilitate them with Jeff. And Jeff, I have to ask you, um, that historical muck that you, that you mentioned early on and, and kind of briefing us of what to expect. You know, what strikes me is that the leadership of Santa Rosa back then in the 1880s and just about to 1906, 1907, maybe 1908, as you describe it, um, were really serving their own best interests, right? So were there any of these prominent men names divulged in any of the material, historical materials that you have come across. Did you say uh, their names were divulged? Yeah, were they, were, did you find any of their names actually having uh, frequented these, these brothels? Oh, no, no, of course not. Um, again, Tan <laughs> Shea was one of the richest men in town and uh, um, had those, those at least three of the brothels. Right, so you, and, and what a name, right? Con, was, it, was that short for something? Cornelius. Cornelius, okay. Cornelius All Shea. Right. What's interesting, you know, is when you look at, of course, the normal histories, you know, they say, oh, Cornelius Shea, he was, you know, this, this, this famous cattle man. Well, yeah, um, he had cows. Um, but he also had, you know, other interests in town, such as, well, this. And it goes he... on to in, in a bit that there was, you know, um, we're, we're, we didn't touch at all about how the, this was 
what started in 1905 was start of a, of a reform movement here in Santa Rosa. And there was something called the Municipal League that really did try to clean up the, the town. Vice president of the Municipal League was this guy named, oh, what's his name? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, Luther Burbank. Um, and there were most, mostly it was a, a temperance movement, or at least, you know, it was to um, uh, close down the saloons. But, you, you know, you, you, once you look at that map again about how there were 30, over 35 saloons downtown, you realize that it, something really had to be done. I mean, this whole town was often, essentially off limits to women. There were no restrooms available unless you went to a, res, uh, a restaurant or the library. And they even tried to shut down the women's restroom in the library to make it another men's reading room. Hmm. So I... So what you're saying is that was to keep the quote unquote proper women in their place so that they didn't see the deal, the doing, the dealings that were happening downtown. Well, um, the original picture, you know, that of the, of the, of the Saturday night on down, downtown was true. The press Democrat described that many times. And it really was, you know, it's very sweet little, little, um, thing like river city and the music man. We were all coming downtown to shop and, there's families there you know, everyone's wearing their Sunday best. They're having a good time. But again, if you walk down a little bit more towards railroad square, it's a, gets to be a pretty wild scene with the saloons. Yeah. Yeah. And that regulation going back to the licensing and the regulations um, and then putting in that this was a way to see if people were coming down with syphilis, if they were having communicable diseases. Um, did that take you into research of what was happening at the hospitals, I'm wondering? Well, Santa Rosa didn't really have much of a hospital at the time, um, which is why, of course, the, 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 um, when Doc Summerfield you know, almost kills himself, he runs down to the nearest pharmacy because there is no right. hospital. So, um, no, and as a matter of fact, the doctor who did the exams was never mentioned either by name. Got it. And I remember in a past webinar that the, the, um, these kinds of pharmacies, um, there were, there were a number of pharmacies, right? There were a number of really small little pharmacies around town as well. So that kind of makes sense. Yes, and this one was next to the Empire Building that he went to. One, one thing I really probably should have worked into the, into the presentation is this also underscores how unique Santa Rosa was in terms of being a, such a compact little city. You come in on the railroad, you came in on the train at Railroad Square, four blocks, you know, you have four blocks there of saloons and you're at Courthouse Square. So if you're then walking over to um, the track, which is now the county fairgrounds, you're angling through the red light district. So it, it's, it's a very walkable town in 1905. If you're, uh, again, a man that's interested in gambling, prostitution, and, gam era and saloon gambling. Right, right. And you mentioned the automobile and that changing the landscape. And then making these um, these watering holes outside of town. Can you add a little bit more to that? Well, I've written a great deal about about the roadhouses, um, and it was it was just a riotous scene that w that went on there. Um, Jake Lopold had the most famous saloon in town. It was right off of right up right off of um, the courthouse, and there was so much money in the roadhouses that he closed it down and opened up a roadhouse out by um, um, the Catholic high school. Uh, and anything went at the roadhouses. Matter of fact, the, there's a whole, the whole other angle of the roadhouses is it essentially brought corruption to the Board of Supervisors at the county level. Because the roadhouses had, had a requirement to get a liquor license, you're supposed to actually be in a hotel. And suddenly all these places saying, oh yeah, we're hotels, we have 40 rooms. And what they were doing were claiming that chicken coops and, you know, uh, sheds were bedrooms. 
Mm. And the approval for this was all dependent upon a member of the Board of Supervisors. The whole thing, on the, in, particularly on the San, uh, Sonoma Valley, uh, was just over the top. There was, uh, it's also not to get into it, but in not, also in 1909, there was a famous uh, place in um, El, El Verano run by Lou Parente, who was later became, you know, the one of the uh, main stopping points for the gangsters in the 20s and 30s, particularly Babyface Nelson. And Jeff, I, might, I, I do need to mention right here that um, just for those of you that are joining us this evening here on Zoom, it does look like our chat is having some technical difficulties. So we're not actually getting your chat here. Um, I am taking some messages right now uh, via text. And so I'm gonna do something that uh, is somewhat unheard of. It's scandalous as well on a webinar, but I am going to avail my cell phone number um, for questions. So those of you that are watching us tonight, uh, if you would like to text a question to my phone number, uh, it is 707-318-5625. That number once again is 707-318-5625. Uh, and I will make the disclaimer right now that I promise not to text you back tomorrow afternoon. This is only for this webinar um, so that you can, you can provide a question and uh, for me to facilitate that with Jeff right here. But it's great chatting with you, Jeff, about, about all of this. What, what's some information around this topic um, that you may have been spurred on to look for and either you couldn't find or you were really surprised to find what really you know kind of st struck you around this topic because you do so much research you really uh have your, your your finger on the pulse of of the history and so i want to find out what what your viewpoint is well the key, the key we wouldn't have known about any of this if it hadn't been for those two guys from oakland uh okay. they just they did more to reveal what was really going on in Santa Rosa than anybody had ever done. Matter of fact, when they, that's when we, if you recall that big headline, the banner headline would be showed there in the middle uh, when they exposed the, the downtown gambling, uh, the press Democrat says, Oh, that's, it's nothing. I mean, it's just the jockeys that are up here that they, they like to gamble after a race. So the press Democrat was a complete apologist for the, and trying to cover up the scene as they had been doing with its predecessor, the Sonoma Democrat, going back to the late 1880s. So only when you looked at the out of town papers like the San Francisco Call and sometimes the Examiner, do you really find what's a really view of what's going on in Santa Rosa. Even that story about the minister, I was surprised that, well, you know, he was extremely popular minister, but we don't know. He's just, you know, he's just gone now. But in the San Francisco call, you find out that, well, the wealthy men in the church didn't like him for some reason because he didn't, he, he objected to cards and dancing. Yeah. And so hats off to the reporters, right? Hats off to the, to the, the new, the newsies. Um, do you have a message here from none other than Ray Johnson? You know Ray. Um, one, he says, great job, Jeff. And he also uh, said that, you know, it's too bad that there isn't any photos of these houses. Uh, have you come across anything like post? I know postcards were big, right, during this time period. Yes. And people would actually send pictures of their houses in postcards. Do you ever come across anything like that? There's one shot. Um... That I briefly considered using. It's from taken from the uh, roof of the courthouse, and you can just see the roof of a couple of the buildings. Okay. And there's, but there's no, and there there are lots of street scenes of Santa Rosa from particularly from 1905, and I think 1908, but nothing on First Street down there. That was just, yeah, you know, not not uh, something you would you would want to take a look at. The interesting right. thing, though, that was that Beamer's crib, um, 
you know, it, it's clearly was, you know, like I said, a crib house with individual doors for going in and out. The women were charged uh, 50 cents a visit, whether it was for an hour or for, you know, the evening. Um, but they were able to go discreet. Their their their, their Johns were able to discreetly go in and out through the door, their own door. And I'm really curious about you know, women's health during this time. I mean, you know, you you mentioned, um, you know, the syphilis and and this these are kind of male centric stories. But I understand, you know, much of the newspaper copy or any information that you can find is usually around the men's stories. Is there any of the women's stories beyond like the Miss Farmer, um, you know, uh, or maybe some of the brothel owners? Are there some of the some of the the actual workers? Do we have any of those stories at all? Oh, yes. But not from Santa Rosa. But oh. I've done did two extensive um, articles because the there was this grand house just outside of the town of Sonoma that was taken over by the state and used to um, around World War One to house prostitutes because they were scared to death. There's a whole campaign that, you know, we would send soldiers off to Europe and, uh, you know, they would have venereal disease. So the matter of fact, the picture of that woman I used for Sadie McLean comes from a whole list, a whole, whole book of mugshots from San Quentin of these women. So they were, they were those, they finally decided, well, we can't keep them here at San Quentin all the time. We'll ship them off and we'll to this farm out of the time, out of the town of Sonoma. So there's a quite a, a lengthy article by there. Just go to my website and type on the word syphilis. Uh, I, I think that's the only time in my life I'm ever going to say that sentence. Uh, and remember, <laughs> and remember too, the syphilis was an incurable, and it really was an incurable disease at the time. We didn't have antibiotics at, the, at, at in that era, so mercury by by chloride was commonly used as a treatment, but it certainly couldn't couldn't have probably, probably couldn't have cured it unless it was a very very mild case caught early. Yeah. And I want to remind our participants that are joining us this evening, and thank you all for joining us um, either on Zoom or on Facebook. On Facebook, you can uh, key in your questions into the comment section. Our administrator does have my, my cell phone number and will be texting those questions to me. Those of you that are on Zoom, I apologize for the uh, lack of being able to key in your questions into the chat. We apologize for those technical difficulties. but. I can uh, provide you with my cell phone number, which is 707-318-5625, and you can send me a text. I'd be happy to ask your question to Jeff as we have him here with us this evening. Uh, I also want to make mention that Jeff, uh, your, your website in and of itself uh, is called santarosahistory.com. Um, it, it's so much of a blog. It's a history blog, I would say. Would you cap, Would you say it's that? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you're so prolific. I mean, it's over 800 entries, right? How, how much are you up to now? Actually, it's, it's, it's not quite yet 800. I think this are the, okay. the resource page I'm going to do um, after this is uh, 797 or something like that. <laughs> well, um, okay. We'll, we'll it's give about, you those three or four. <laughs> it worked, I, for, fortunately, it's WordPress, and you can do all these fun things in WordPress, like say, how many words have I written? And it's now, um, so I think it's a little over 2.3 million. 2.3 so, million words. Yeah. So if you, you printed them all up, you'd, you know, you'd have a nice stack of books you could use to prop up that broken leg on the coffee table. There you go. Yeah, or, or the baby's crib, you know, when they get a little stuffy, get the head of the crib up, right? Sure. Um, well, and I, I want to make mention that it's such a resource on your website. I mean, when any of us are looking up something, uh, SantaRosaHistory.com comes up. I mean, a lot of people stumble upon it their first time just because they're looking up something about their family history or something about maybe their house, 
And then there's this amazing website um, that is just chock full of information. And what Jeff has uh, shared with us this evening is actually uh, going to be on his website with links for all the items that have been discussed. So um, share a little bit about that with us, uh, about how this is going to be presented on, on your website. Well, I'm just simply going to take, I, I had, when, in writing this, you know, I collected from, um, I think about 15 articles I've written related to it. And so I'm simply going to have links up there with, a, you know, a brief one sentence description. So you can follow through from, you know, the Cronkies Park stuff, um, you know, clear through the 19, 1910 decision and link, links to what's going on about, about um, roadhouses and stuff. One little anecdote that may amuse you is that I wrote years ago, I wrote an article about this guy who, and I forget it, I think it was like 1914, um, this doughy middle-aged man who sold cars in San Francisco decide, had a midlife crisis and decided he wanted to become um, an auto daredevil. And he, his yeah. trick was he was going to drive with his hands tied behind his head. <laughs> now, he had, and he had the car he had. Again, we're talking these huge old roadsters. It had an inline stick shift. So if you, like, threw, um, um, like, a scarf or something over the stick shift, you could push it around with your knee so you could shift gears. And he could steer with his knees and have the brakes and things. And he did the craziest things. And he came to Santa Rosa. And one of the things, they didn't, he didn't do it here. They did, I think it was in Sacramento. They, ha they built a fake house, a two-story house, that he jumped over. So he would, they had this big ramp, he'd speed up the ramp and jump over the house and come crashing down on the other side. Uh, and his other shtick was they, they, they would do mid-air crashes. But again, we're talking, you know, 1914 Oldsmobiles. These things were huge. So it was just the most amazing story. And then like months later, I got a note from somebody in the family that says, we didn't know about anything of this. It had been it had been completely lost to the family history. They said that my grandpa did this, <laughs> so that was quite that was quite a surprise. That was quite a delight. That that's I I love that I love that story. I want to share with you now. Um, Denise Hill actually has shared with us that Con Shay's uh, impressive house. Uh, so his yes. house oh, yes. was moved. Yeah, you 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 know this from Mendocino Avenue now and now resides on the 600 block of B Street in the Rose in the St. Rose Historic District. So, um, so you I'm sure you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, that's that's his his family house, of course. That wasn't one of the houses. That wasn't one of the Bordellos. Beautiful, beautiful house. Um, it's now a, it's now a rooming house. Uh, but if you ever go down there that area just take a moment to appreciate it it's just full of these gorgeous details all right that's great and i'll just repeat that for those of you that didn't get that down in your notes if you're taking notes um now that house resides on um the 600 block of b street in the saint rose historic district so you can check that out um I remember Denise Hill actually gave us a whole rundown of houses in the St. Rose Historic District. Um, so that's a webinar to check out. I haven't mentioned that tonight. It's a great segue is that on the uh, Historical Society Santa Rosa's um, page, you can actually, it's on their YouTube page that you can actually look at these past webinars that have been presented on Zoom and tonight's webinar will also reside on their YouTube page um, within about 24 hours or so. So if you have missed any of the previous webinars or um, if you didn't catch something tonight or maybe wanna pass it on to a friend of yours that's curious about this topic, you might want to visit that YouTube page um, for the Historical Society of Santa Rosa. We also have a message here uh, saying, thanks for the great talk. Uh, and it, the person, this uh, text message is asking if there's any of the buildings discussed tonight 
uh, may still be standing. So do you know of any of those those highlighted buildings um, are, are still with us today? No, I mean, again, you, you know, you go down First Street, there's First Street became um, in the 40s. It became uh, basically auto maintenance garage shops and stuff like that. Yeah. So no, there's there's and, and of course you know it was the street was essentially um, changed during the great um, work in the sixties. No, not great, but horrible work in the sixties <laughs> when they started realigning stuff. By the way, right. I also may also mention that I do plan to do a follow up, bringing the story clear through the thirties. And the mention of Denise's note reminds me that one of the more interesting houses I'm going to be talking about is also uh, on B Street, just a little south of the Khan Shea House. It's the Norma Apartments, still standing. The Norma Apartments were rented by the hour. So it's this large apartment building, and again, a beautiful building, still there, and there were there were stories in the press democrat that were just that were just hinted that there were wild things going on there um if there's any place in santa rosa that you want to say boy if these walls could talk it would be the norma apartments i'll guarantee you what did you mention where those are at i'm sure that it, it's on b question. street uh just b street and i think it's the corner of b street and 10th it's right next to the uh the historic houses yeah, so that's um, is that that pink building? I want to say. No, it, it's it's no. a uh, it's a three story brick apartment building. Oh, as I, as got I it, got it. It's got okay. a courtyard, courtyard, and everything else. Okay. But there was the scene did indeed continue on in, in smaller details in, in the twenties, thirties, and forties. Roberts Avenue, Troy, Tro, Trowbridge Avenue, or Street, I forget. Um, there was more prostitution, you know, still in the 20s and 30s around here, but it wasn't yeah. quite, you know, it wasn't the same scene at all. Well, here's an interesting question for you. Are you aware if any of the buildings were um, accessible to each other underground? Were they tied together underground at all? Was there any underground activity going on? No, no. These are these are these are really really just houses, except for the Beamer House. There, and some of them, uh, when I mentioned that two of them became um, stopping um, bordellos, one was used by uh, Japanese families, I recall. So they really mm. were, just, were, just, were just houses. A lot of downtown, even on 4th Street, were private houses, even uh, west of E Street. So if you look at, if you went, it went back to those Sanborn maps that I, I showed and magnify it, you're going to find a surprising number of house, per, you know, family houses uh, really close between D and E Street all over downtown. So what we where we would see Russian River Brewery, um, that's between D and E Street mm -hmm. on Fourth. Um, at that time, there were actual residences. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Gives you just kind of some frame of reference right there. Um, also, here's a here's a bit of information. Conche. Uh, Con loaned Frank and Joe Grace. So there's the Grace name right there, uh, $7,500 to, to fund the brewery. And Bud Shea, Con's son, so Bud was, was the son of Con. Um, Sounds was, biblical. I, it does. I had a hard time even saying that out loud. Was in um, on the Golden Gate Board of Directors during his life, and uh, Jake's. And I'm not no. I don't know what Jake's is referring to. Jake's was at Gwen's Corner, which is where the Orchard Inn was. Yes. The the give Jake us, give, the 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 Jake Luppel Roadhouse that I mentioned. Oh, okay. So that's the, that's the roadhouse. Thank you. Right. Okay. So, and then I just got another text message right here. Um, the Norma apartments is at B and eighth street, and it is the pink stucco, um, building with a tile roof. So that, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I thought that was, so there's a pink there's a pink building right there, and it does have a little courthouse. It has little steps that go up to the to the mm -hmm. the front entry doors. 
Um, and it actually has like a little water fountain kind of a thing in the in the courtyard. And mm -hmm. the, it actually has up on top of the um, the top floor uh, on the roof, there's like an extra little, a little tiny room or building or something like up there. I don't really understand that, but I'm always curious to how that works. Huh. But by the way, here's another little believe it or not fact. Um, of course, Dan, Dan Beamer that I mentioned many times was, you know, the, the landlord of the, that, the crib house. And I mentioned that you know, suddenly we're having all these cab companies popping up every single month. The very first one was owned by Dan's brother, Ed. So mm. um, suddenly the Beamers are now are driving you out to your roadhouses. Uh, there you go. How many of these roadhouses were around, do you know? There were, uh, um, I never even tried to count. There were three between Santa Rosa and Sebastopol. There was one famous one, and, and of course, um, some of these became not speakeasies directly, but, well, yeah, they did become speakeasies, but they, you know, were, were not in the same buildings generally. I mean, the, these many of these roadhouses were simply a, uh, um, a couple 50-gallon barrels with a board across the top for the bar. Got it. And just a correction right there that... Um... Bud was actually on the Grace Brothers board of directors. I didn't realize that there was a board of directors for the Grace Brothers, um, but he was on the on that. Uh, so, yeah, everybody seems to be a little bit connected. Not very, not very different from today, right? There's only a few degrees of of separation from from each of us. If you've been here for a few years in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County, so. Yeah, it was, uh, again, everybody pretty much knew everybody else. And, you know, if you owned the, owned one of these, if you didn't own, own one of the brothels, if you didn't own one of the saloons, you still probably were getting some money out of it. I mean, there, people would stay overnight in Santa Rosa, so there's money for the hotels, there's the, re there's the restaurants. You know, a lot of money was coming into town because of this, un of this underground economy we had going. And it kept on going there for 20 years. Yeah. I missed a, I missed a text early on and I, 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 I want to, I want to bring it up now. Um, it's actually from Holly hoods of the Healdsburg museum. And one, she wants to thank you for a well-researched presentation. Uh, and she mentions that she has researched Healdsburg's red light history and would be happy to share it and compare her research so the two of you might be connecting soon um, she noticed uh, the proximity of chinese businesses to the female boarding houses on the on the sanborn map um, that you shared was wondering if your research revealed any clues to the social interaction between the sex workers and the chinese neighborhoods and their businesses no, none at all but she's absolutely right second street was the Chinese neighborhood in Santa Rosa. And like, like she says, if you look at those Sanborn maps, they're, they're right next to each other. So no, but I never saw any kind of connection to it. Um, another thing I, I've certainly speculated about is that there were so many women that worked here. I've always wondered, and again, Santa Rosa was the hub of um, on the train line. So were some of these women, particularly during the week, going out to logging camps and such? I mean, we know that there were there were there was a brothel in Burnville, but I remember reading about a, uh, um, a an arrest and a fight at Jenner, and was I didn't recognize any of the names, but could the, you know were these women from Santa Rosa just basically going out and doing um you know week week middle of the week jobs, were they going up to Humboldt and, and such? Because there's certainly you know s stories about um, setting up you know. In the, in the logging camps, prostitutes coming by and setting up for you know, a day or two or three. Well, yeah, and certainly their stories are broader than, 
than uh, than the night at the brothel, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure those stories are rich, uh, but unfortunately, we just don't have as much uh, chronicles history around around women's stories um, back at that time, or you know, even leading up to uh, the 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 20s and the 30s. Um, well, more, more than you think. I wrote a story about, I think it was 1911, about human trafficking. And it centers on one of the, the, town in the towns in the Springs that uh, a woman brought over, and I think it was either her sister or her sister-in-law, to prostitute her. And, of course, down in the town of Sonoma, there was the famous Spanish kitty who had a very large brothel. But the scene in the Sonoma Valley was, was, was huge. Um, it was, there were probably more prostitutes between Santa Rosa and Sonoma than anywhere else after the 19, after 1910, during that era. Well, I don't know that that's a claim to fame that we are going to hang our hats on, but <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly a bit of information here. And we so appreciate you, um, Jeff, for, uh, you know, constantly doing the research and then so eloquently sharing it with all of us, um, not just in uh, in person virtual webinars like this, uh, but also in your written work. It, it's really a treasure. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leslie. And at this time, for those of you that have been joining us, uh, I do believe that we've answered all of the questions. I remember that this information is going to be a resource on Jeff's website. So do check that out if you haven't already. Like I said, bookmark it on your laptop, on your computer, santarosahistory.com. It is full of information. You are going to find a little bit about just about everything. Um, but tonight's information will have links to all the items that have been discussed. And remember that tonight's webinar itself, this recording will be uploaded onto the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's YouTube page. Um, so do look at that. And I do wanna make mention of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's website itself. You've got the URL right there, historicalsocietysantarosa.org. That is where you want to tune in for upcoming events that will be coming here in 2022 as well as 2023. And you also wanna avail yourself of the Historical Society of Santa Rosa's website in order to become a member and to make your donation. Now, those donations help to keep the Historical Society going and they do enjoy you joining and becoming a member as well. So it's been an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. I hope that you all gained a bit of information and maybe made a little bit of the scandalous information that we thought we were gonna be getting. Not so scandalous, actually. It was part of everyday life. It was part of how our city was built, and it is part of our history. So thank you once again, Jeff Elliott, for being with us here this evening. And to everybody, I hope you have a great evening. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you at our upcoming event. Make sure to check it out at the Historical Society, Santa Rosa org, and that will be listed soon. Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. <laughs>